Boom, 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 literature gets a look. Let's talk about books. And welcome back to Legs Talk About Books, the bi-yearly podcast where we talk about books. I'm a hard leg Joe, if and you didn't know, joined as always by the spookiest co-host I can find, MBT. Boom! Did I get you? <laughs> <laughs> That's just one of the many frights you'll experience tonight. Behold, instead of a podcast, we'll have... A pod person cast. Join me as we talk about books. Is that anything? <laughs> it's real Something bottom of the I barrel shit. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, this doesn't have this podcast doesn't have the biggest audience anyway, so they're they're just fine to hear us yap. Just sit down, have a nice little comfy time by the fire. You know, just don't think about that thing creeping up behind you. When we last spoke, I was but the podcast tour, but now I am the podcast T. Let me say, oh, yeah. as the progenitor of a podcast with a whopping almost 200 listeners, uh, <laughs> it turns out the number one thing people want to hear is yapping. I was under the impression that like what people want is like extremely structured, tight podcasts, but what they really want is something to throw on while they're driving to a job they hate. And, uh, you know, that means that this is perfect. Yeah, we do that pretty well. I guess it is worth mentioning, too, for the, the like, two people who are fans of me but somehow don't know about you. Uh, what is the name of your podcast? Uh, it's called Will of the Council. Myself and other Yu-Gi-Oh! space creators, Danny and uh, Peeps Yu-Gi-Oh!, real name Jordan, uh, speak at length about the people who are just so in over their head on reddit.com. Yeah, it's just like, am I the asshole threads and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've had you on, haven't we? Yeah, I was on a, I was like on a Patreon episode though. So if you want to hear me, you'll have to do, you'll have to join the Patreon. Yeah, for sure. Either that, or you could just continue listening here, which is not on Patreon. <laughs> I was gonna say, ah, if fancy. they want to hear you, they actually have many opportunities. One of which is yeah. occurring right now. <laughs> but yes, yes. All the introductions aside, we are here today in this most spooky month to read. Camp Damascus by Chuck Tingle. Or I guess not read. We already read it. We're talking about it. We're discussing it. If you've missed the previous legs talk about books, basically we're going to give some spoiler-free thoughts. We're going to tell you a little bit about this. And then uh, we're just going to jump into some questions. Just talk about some of the neat stuff that this book does. Yeah, I'm, I'm in. Just to start off, before we get into this, how familiar are you with Chuck Tingle? <laughs> Here's where I play my hand. I am incredibly familiar with Chuck Tingle. Um, <laughs> when he first sort of popped onto the scene in like 2016, I was one of the day one true believers. There was a period where I had read everything he had ever written. Oh. And I found it so funny. I thought it was the greatest thing ever. <laughs> But also, I really did appreciate the writing. I thought it was fun in a way that was easy to read instead of like being this taxing kind of BS. For those of you that aren't familiar with Chuck Tingle, he is mostly famous not for his horror work, but for a series of gay romance novels. Most famous. I'm not sure I would call that romance. More like gay erotica. Uh, as long as you find yeah. like pterodactyls erotic. Yeah, his, his most famous work, I think, is probably Pounded in the Butt by My Own Butt. <laughs> A, a sci-fi thriller in which a, a clone of a man's ass has sex with him. And it's touching. That book was followed up by <laughs> Pounded in the Butt by my book, Pounded in the Butt by my own butt. And then Pounded in the Butt by my book, Pounded in the Butt by my own butt by my book, Pounded in the Butt by my own butt. <laughs> a process that continued for about seven iterations. And he just kept publishing them. And they, they were only like 30 pages a piece. But each one, I think, was very enjoyable. And I devoured them all. He writes about uh, gay sex between a man and Bigfoot, a man and the physical manifestation of his fears, a man and his anxieties given human form in the form of like a, a large pterodactyl. There's just a lot going on <laughs> in all of these. Yeah, actually, if, if you're watching this for the first time and you haven't seen the podcast before, if you're just here for, for MBT, we actually read this with my other co-host for April Fool's one day. We did the uh, Space Raptor Butt Invasion trilogy. It's, it's good. And we did A Pound a Day Keeps the Butt Okay. I don't know what Which that is was. a series of novelettes about people having relations 
with the physical manifestations of the days of the week. So, like, a guy meets Monday, and Monday's, like, a big hunky dude. He's like, oh, Monday, the day. I'm so familiar with you. I mean, I'm kind of, it's really annoying when I have to wake up to you, but, like, everyone knows your name. I think the, um, the sort of transformation from Chuck Tingle from this, like, online meme author to, I guess I would say, not like a real author, because, like, what does that even mean? But, like, as someone who writes books you can buy in a store, yeah. <laughs> happened around the same time as J.K. Rowling was kind of losing her mind about trans people. Yeah, I think that was his first novel, was about the trans wizard. Yeah, Harriet Porber. It is a... Yeah. <laughs> It, it, it took off in a way that uh, none of the others really have, and uh, it's about four times the length as the usual tingler, as they're called. And I guess we should make it clear that normally, like, the books, like, the pound a day keeps the butt okay. Like, every one of those stories is, like, four pages. The, the tinglers are usually very short. They're about 20 to 40 pages a piece, yeah. The most recent works by him are, I remember he teased for a long time, straight was his first sort of like novel novel and was actually like sort of billed as more of a horror story than a, a gay romance. I did not read that. Um, and then it was yeah, followed I, by... I thought it was another shit post. <laughs> yeah, it was followed by uh, Camp Damascus, which we read today. Yeah, and I believe he has another one that came out this year. Yeah, it's the, he Barrier just came Gaze? up with uh, Barrier Gaze, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which I've, I've seen a couple, like, bigger, like, booktubers talking about, so maybe we should have checked that one out, but this one just has, it's a lot more eye-catching. Yeah, Not sure if sure. you've seen the, uh, the cover. I could throw that up there on the screen, but, like, the screaming mouth that's barfing out flies and the, like, spooky glowing cabin and everything. It's, it's definitely got more horror vibes. It looks like, again, I don't want to say, like, a legitimate book, but it yeah. looks... Like a novel that isn't a shitpost, something that's going to have, like, characters that I'll feel something for, and not something I'll just, like, laugh at and then forget, like, ten minutes later. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we should say, for the people who, you know, have been hearing all this, and it's like, did this did this guy write a legitimate book? Yes. Yes, he did. Going into the spoiler-free section, I'll say, like, I quite enjoyed this book. It's surprisingly well-written. It has pretty good world-building. It has characters that you enjoy. I was looking back at my notes because last year we talked about Mexican Gothic, mm. which was like an okay book. Mm. And I said in that, like in my notes, I wrote, I usually don't give a score, like a number score to books, but Mexican Gothic is like a six out of 10 if ever there was one. I think Camp Damascus is better than that. I don't know how much better because I get I don't really usually put scores or whatever, but, like, if you could enjoy that, I think you would enjoy this as well. Yeah. For me, I, I also did like this book uh, a great deal. I'll be completely honest with you. I binged it in one night. <laughs> it was one of those books where, like, at, like, 9 p.m., I was like, all right, let's knock out some of this. And I just was up until 1. And I was like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> it was it was an easy read. It was uh, yeah. an easy read. Um, I would say there are some elements of it that kind of wear its influence from other YA novels on its sleeve, where it's like, okay, this is a book written for a very specific audience of like young adults. But uh, I, I'm glad you brought up the book that we did last year, Mexican Gothic, because one of my frustrations with that book is it was meant to sort of put you at a sense of unease with how the general setting exuded this kind of cosmic Eurocentrism. Yeah, it was very cerebral, I guess would be the word for it. It, it, it was took, a thinking man's horror. Sort of. I mean, it, it was never really unclear what the, the scary part of the book was. Um, and then when it took a turn to have like monsters in it and shit, it was like, well, this is the logical conclusion of what's going on here. But it's also a conclusion I came to about 200 pages before the book did. And so, like, th we spent, like, 12 scenes being, like, and here's the scary, evil, colonial man. And it's like, yes, of course, we all know this. And here's another scene with him. Yeah. Uh, this one wasted almost no time getting to things that were scary. Yeah. And I appreciated that. There was, like, there were gross, scary, freaky things that happened in this book from, like, page four. Yeah. And... While it did have a lot of the same sort of suffocating system in which these individuals live is in a large part responsible for the horror elements, it also did have scary monsters. 
Yeah, like, there's there's definitely an element of, like, societal horror, of, like, the horror of being trapped into, like, a role that you don't want to live. But that's also paired with vomiting up flies. Yeah, also which is there's like, evil for someone things. Who doesn't, <laughs> for someone who doesn't like bugs, that was like, oh, skin crawling. And, yeah, there's, uh, I guess it's not really a spoiler to be like, there are demons in this book. Yeah. Like, fucking scary, spooky-ass, hollow-eyed, gaunt, like big claw demons and the way they describe them uh you know it brings some chills i was reading this like late at night like three in the morning and like i heard a bump outside and it kind of made me jump like it gets you in that mood sometimes oh yeah it it is it is a really thrilling story i was just gonna say especially a lot of modern horror i feel like and granted we haven't read a lot of it but uh, even just looking at something like a lot of the analog horror, like the video stuff going out, it feels like everyone's trying to be subtle. Everyone's trying to be really clever about how they scare you. And this was almost refreshing with how in your face it was with just like, no, there's a fucking thing right there that's terrifying and it wants to hurt you. Mm-hmm. I, I did like it for those reasons. I will say, in terms of the actual writing in the book, there is a little that is, I, I guess I would say, executed less than perfectly. There's yeah. a lot of, like... You I, mentioned YA stuff. It, it reads a little bit like a nano that, like, had one Passover, and I think it would have benefited from, like, a longer editing process. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure that the original run of this was self-published, and... For that reason, you know, it, it does kind of wear it on its sleeve. It, it, it does kind of reflect that. There are some parts that are like, okay, we get it. Like, this could have been cut out in editing. Yeah. But there's also some decisions that have been made that are not completely boilerplate that I think push this into a really interesting territory that I think we'll get a little more into when we talk about the f- spoilerific uh, version of events. Yeah. And uh, ultimately, I, I did end up really enjoying it a lot. I will just say as sort of like a final thing, like I would I would recommend this. Oh, for sure. Maybe if you're a little squeamish about horror, because I know some people like any amount of blood or any amount of like bones breaking. Like this is not like super gory, but it's, I mean, despite the fact that some of the writing feels like a YA novel sometimes, there is some shit in here that is like genuinely kind of like terrifying and gross mm-hmm. in a pretty gory way. You could tell, again, we'll get to some of the influences later, but I, you might want to worry a little bit about that. But if that doesn't bother you and you're looking for just like an exciting story, definitely check out Camp Damascus. But yeah, that's it for a spoiler free talk. From here on, we're just taking the train to Spoiler Town, talking about everything. We're either going to assume that you've already read this book or you have no interest in reading it. You just want to hear us yap about it. And we're going to start by giving like a little synopsis, I guess, a little rundown just to either remind people who have read it or for the people who haven't. Uh, Did you want to start that off or you want me to take that over? Yeah, no, I'm happy to run through it. Okay. So... Camp Damascus takes place in this fictional city in which the entire economy is basically subsidized by this camp at the center of it called Camp Damascus. It is affiliated with a sect of Christianity to which the main character and her family and most of her friends all belong uh, called the Kingdom of the Pine. It is a sect that claims there's one additional prophet after the ones that we all know and love who preaches some admittedly pretty middle-of-the-road additional tenets of Christianity. Yeah. There is something I want to talk about later, but it is important that, like, while you might call the Kingdom of Pine, like, a cult, it's like a cult in the same way that, like, the Jehovah's Witnesses are. Like, those might well, be a little I, more extreme than I would say the, even the Kingdom less. of Pine. It is, yeah. it is and uh, attempts are made in the book to drive home. It is a very normal outgrowth of Christianity. Like, it's not that yeah. freakish. This camp, Camp Damascus, uh, is very popular and so economically, uh, you know, uh, profitable because it is a gay conversion camp that boasts a 100% success rate with no recidivism, right? So yeah. people from all around come to put their kids in the camp. They come out not gay anymore, right? So Yeah, and they pay a lot of money to do so. Our main character, who is autistic, um, and we'll talk about the writing with relationship to autism a little later, but I, I just want to echo real quick. I really like how she's written. Has some weird feelings and memories that she can't shake just in general, 
and feels that there is a sort of societal pressure for her to shack up with another individual at Kingdom of the Pine, uh, a boy named Isaiah, who is just like a classic hormonal teenager. Yeah. She, He's just a dude. One night, she coughs up a huge glob of insects at the dinner table, which her parents hide from her, kind of freaking out a little bit. They kind of pretend like, oh, it's not that big a deal. You must have just swallowed a couple eggs while you were off swimming in the, 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 the river or whatever. Uh, speaking of swimming in the river, at a waterfall jump, she sees a weird, freakish, ethereal person with a name tag that says, what's the, what's the... Uh, she doesn't read it till later, but I think it's Packet Packet. Patched. Packet, yeah. This person shows up again as she goes to a party and kills a girl for which uh, our main character is having some weird, confusing feelings. Yeah. <laughs> Poking around for a while, the girl finds out that her uh, doctor slash therapist, her family, and largely a significant portion of the Kingdom of the Pine individuals have been lying to her, and that she was gay and taken to Camp Damascus to become an yeah. ex-gay. It's one of the interesting sort of twists about this. Based on the title, you would think that the story largely takes place at the camp, or that it would build up to her being sent to the camp. But no, you find out pretty early on that, like, no, she's already been to the camp, and you're dealing with the after effects of that. Right. She finds out this information by breaking into a couple of places she wasn't supposed to, and her mom tips her off that her father and some members of the church are going to put her back there, so she becomes a runaway. While a runaway, she meets up with a former camp counselor who has since kind of broken his conditioning. And the two of them figure out through recovered memories through epinephrine while she was having a heart attack that at the camp, <laughs> they perform this ritual called tethering in which a literal demon from actual hell is attached to each individual gay kid. And if the kid has gay thoughts, the demon is permitted to kill the person that they're lusting after or hurt them. I think her fingers get broken. Yeah. And through a kind of quirk of good luck, she runs into the old flame that she had prior to the camp. She then has a run-in with that person's demon and accidentally kills the demon by locking it in a burning car, at which point she realizes that fire can kill these demons and that hell is actually very cold. Yeah. And so uh, her and this ex-counselor construct a Rube Goldberg-style contraption they use to <laughs> kill both her and the camp counselor's demons, and then... Her, her old flame, and the camp counselor go back to the camp to destroy the machine that allows them to tether demons to humans. They go in and learn that both a machine exists that does this, and the reason they remember nothing from the camp is because from the same dimension as the demons exist is this insect that as part of its breeding process ejects a sort of a hormone or something that causes you to kind of lose your memories. It lays its eggs inside of you and then it makes you forget about it. I think they compare it to like a mosquito having a um, sort of numbing agent where they're like, yeah, you won't freak out or try to get rid of the eggs if you forget. And they have specifically bred these creatures to increase that memory loss. The important thing, I guess, to mention about the demons is that for most of the people, the demons don't attack. They just kind of yeah. show up yeah. and you're so terrified of them they, they go to depths to talk about, like, Pavlov conditioning. Like, you see the demon, and then you stop having the gay thoughts because you associate gay thoughts with the scary demon hunting you from the distance. Mm -hmm. So they have a run-in with the old doctor slash therapist, but they are able to overcome him. They destroy the machine. And then upon leaving the center in which this tethering process happens, they are ambushed by people from the Kingdom of the Pine and also a ton of demons. Yeah. At this point, the main character recites an incantation she found from a recovered book that unseals these demons. And those demons then completely wreak havoc and kill all of the uh, members of Kingdom of the Pine and the counselors. And then they all go home. And that's the end. Yeah. And they all live happily ever after, except for the camp counselors who got killed by demons and shit. Well, they, they did those not... Those demons are no fucking joke. They did not get killed. They lived eternally, <laughs> uh, as minimally as possible, in as much pain as they can endure. It was not good. Yeah, the demons rarely kill you. They, like, take your brain out and then keep your brain in a jar with, like, electrodes connected to the pain centers so that you just exist forever in a state of eternal pain. Yeah, it's not good. 
It's like the science fiction, like, version of hell. It's one of the few things that, like, we talk about, like, oh, this kind of reads like a YA novel. Except whenever they talk about hell. Yeah. Then it's, like, skinless people and guys with, like, their their mouths sewn shut and their eyes removed and, like, exposed nervous systems. And I'm like, oh, oh, sweet Jesus. That is, g- wow. That's not something I would want a young adult to read. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> uh, they can take it. They can take yeah. Jujutsu Kaisen's probably more gory. They they like the Chainsaw Man. He does stuff like that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I, y'all have to take your word for it. Oh, I don't know. I just, I just assumed his name is Chainsaw Man. And I guess jumping into our first topic, I do want to go ahead and talk about the horror element of it because it feels like the last, like, four years we've been trying to read spooky stories finding something that was scary. And this is probably one of the more scary ones. It has just about, like, every kind of thing that you could be creeped out of. You know, the demons at first are stalking you from the distance. It's got that fear of the unknown, the inhuman creatures. And then it kind of ramps up to where, like, yeah, they can break your neck. They'll break your fingers. You've got the gross-out scares of vomiting bugs. You've got all the people in your life like, lying to you, like, that kind of social fear of, like, being deceived. And then, strangely, all of this builds in a way that kind of reminds me of John Carpenter's The Thing. Are you familiar with that uh, movie at all? Yeah, of course. Yeah, okay, it's classic, classic horror movie. And it's one of those horror movies where, like, yes, there's a focus on the horror, but also in fighting the horror, rather than a lot of slasher movies where the characters spend a lot of time just running from it. There's a lot of attention paid to, as you said, figuring out that the demons have a physical thing that can hurt them, figuring out the rules for how they work, uh, devising a contraption that can hunt and kill them. And for me, I really like that. Uh, I think horror is better when the characters aren't helpless. I think fear of the unknown is good. But you can have people learn about the horror elements as long as everything they learn is more frightening than what they didn't know. You know, uh, when you first see the demons, they're scary. But when you actually see like a portal into hell, it only gets more frightening. (laughs) Yeah. But I also do know there are people who, when they see horror elements being treated scientifically, it kind of takes the wind out of their sails. It makes them feel as like, oh, well, now I don't have to be scared of these things. They can just be killed with fire. Personally, I, I I liked it. I did think that it was scary. I think you're right. It, there's a lot of sort of like social isolation stuff, as you would expect in a book that's about like a town that's centered around a cult style hanger on to Christianity, right? Yeah. I think we have kind of been burned for the last couple of years by stories that are like, ah, but the true horror is being different. And I'm like, okay, yeah, of course it is. But, you know, but. Um, I, I would also like there to be a scary guy. Yeah. Uh, and the scary guy in here, I think, is quite scary. It is very, like, classic horror movie in that uh, the scary demon is literally just, a like, a Jeff the Killer style, like, a creepy-looking person. Yeah. I guess the only functional difference here is all the demons wear, like, this red polo shirt. And, With a name uh, tag on it. <laughs> and has a name tag on it. And at some point, one of the characters is like, why the fuck are they wearing the shirts? And the other one's like... They're probably just at work. And I was like, oh, well, that's <laughs> that's the scariest part of all. To go back to Staples, I can't do it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think they kind of mentioned that the people working for the Kingdom of the Pine, because they mm-hmm. have, they haven't just tethered these demons or just like, you know, convinced them to work for them. They've used some kind of ritual to basically enslave them. The demons yeah. are forced to work for them. And I get the idea that they're like, well, we can't just have them walking around naked. We need to give them some kind of shirt. You know, we're decent people. That's very funny. I had not thought of that to be like, they definitely at one point were like, oh, you got to cover those up. Absolutely yeah. not. <laughs> that that does go, even when you're talking about the horror of society, I feel like this does it so much better because the characters do have that sinister thing of like, they believe they're helping people. They're like, yeah, we are saving you from eternal damnation. We're doing something good. And they're so blinded by that, that they're willing to work for literal demons that kill and torture people. (laughs) 
We'll we'll get to this when we talk about hell is real, but this discussion kind of surrounds what I think is the most interesting part of the work, and I don't want to blow my load too quick. Personally, I didn't think that like revealing the demons were scientific, I guess, lessened much of anything because they I guess they were like we knew a little bit about like how they worked or the logistics of it or whatever. But even the characters remark on it. They're like, we're going off like a case study of one point of information <laughs> like we're making a lot of inferences here and it becomes clear really quick that like what they intend to do isn't always going to work and like uh, doesn't work fantastically i don't know I, I i was fine with it yeah i will say it's not even necessarily the scientific thing but like when you think of uh japanese horror like the grudge or whatever you have these beings that are like incomprehensible that are walking through walls that seem to be able to hunt you down no matter what and at first, that's kind of how the demons seem here. They're like incorporeal. It's not even clear that they can affect the world right up until they like twist a girl's head backwards. Mm. So in some ways, the like learning the fact that like they can be killed at all, that they are mortal beings, I could see a lot of people being like, well, if it bleeds, I can kill it. <laughs> mm. But while we're on the topic of horror, you did mention uh, the bugs and how inconsequential they seem to you. So there's two big decisions made in this work that I I really thought were interesting. A significant amount of this book, especially as it closes towards the end, is a little paint by numbers. It's like, okay, we all kind of expect X is going to happen, and then it happens, and it's like, great. But there's two things that I, I really thought were kind of interesting. And the first is the bugs. So yeah. throughout the work, all the characters who have been to Camp Damascus occasionally do this thing where they'll just like vomit out like a fistful of living bugs, which is gross. Mm -hmm. And so the question, of course, is what the hell? Uh, well, it turns out that these bugs are the result of the aforementioned insect that makes you forget implanting like a brood of eggs in you. And while a significant amount of them dissolve like in your bloodstream, uh, many of them don't. <laughs> and will mature to adulthood, and then you barf them out a couple of years later, right? Yeah. I believe they said something about their life cycle is actually triggered by beings that are similar to them or by the environment that they come from, like hell, essentially. Yeah. They usually barf off the bugs after they have, like, a gay thought or after they uh, have an encounter with the demon because some proximity either to the demon itself or the demon opening a portal to hell kind of allows them to gestate a little bit. But what ends up happening is when they find the bug, they make very clear the reason they're using the bug has everything to do with its sort of memory inhibiting qualities and nothing to do with the actual reproductive cycle. Yeah. Like that this this vomiting up bugs is just an unfortunate side effect that they didn't <laughs> intend. And like many people just straight up don't experience. It's just like this gross thing that happens a couple of times and it's like, Oh, but this is like not any of our design. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, it does make you, I think, at least a little uneasy because what is happening at the camp is clearly evil, as demonstrated by the fact that the people who it is done to have this dark, visceral reaction to it by vomiting up carrion and bugs. But then you realize that like, Actually, that's not the intention of the camp at all, and it's just this thing that happens. Which leads me into kind of the, the second, I think, more interesting thing that happens in this work, which is that hell is real in it. <laughs> so I, I don't know if, you, if you're okay with moving on to this. Yeah, we could do, we could do some religious talk. Yeah, I think it's kind of a, a pretty clear A to B. So yeah. the most interesting decision made in this work, bar none, is the fact that hell is real. There's an obvious mechanism by which the church could be performing these conversions uh, for completely cynical reasons, right? It's mentioned that the main character's parents spent half a million dollars to ungay her, right? Yeah. It's baked into their, like, cult has a bunch of published books by their prophet, and one of them is like, we must run the church as a business lest businesses supplant the role of the church, which... You know, I would expect, like, oh, the church has to be run as a business as, like, this really cynical, like, cloying kind of takedown of epic Christianity. But that's, like, not a bad point. In America, business largely does occupy a lot of the same brain space as religion for yeah. us. 
And I guess going into the, the world building too, it kind of makes sense that an American sect of Christianity would focus on like, earning money is good, we should be fruitful and make a profit. <laughs> yeah, like look at Mormonism. No, but so um, <laughs> what ends up happening is you would think, oh, they're doing this for the money that funds the church. That's why they're doing it. But they're not. Uh, like you mentioned a little earlier, they think they're doing the right thing. And it's kind of hard to argue with them. So in the work, you learn that hell is a real place that exists. It is this sort of extra dimensional location that these demons from the Bible, a bunch of Apocrypha, the Gnostic Gospels all originate from, right? Yeah. And it is a freezing wasteland in which these demons kind of take delight at inflicting mass pain on people. Yeah. Now, it's never said out and out that, like, this is the place you go when you die, right? Yeah, that is one of the curious things, because I'm not sure if they're, like, any of the bodies are actually dead. They make a good point of, like, those that they take, they, like, take their brain or they take their body, they break their arms and legs, and then they drag them to hell. You don't become a spirit in hell. Yeah, you're, like, living. And you're, like, they make a good point of being, like, you are, like, alive in many ways down there. Yeah. They also make a good point of being, like, but the physiognomy is completely different. We can't really be, like, you know, X is alive or dead. So, but at least it's implied that this is a place you could go at the end of your life, right? Yeah. It's a supernatural place. Yeah. And it sucks. Yeah. It's like, it's influenced from like Dante's account of hell in, you know, the Divine Comedy, of course. It's like very frigid. It's like frozen over. And the church is explicitly performing these sort of dubious anti-gay rituals basically to protect people from going there. Yeah. And like, I don't know. It's, it's really strange because for a lot of like conservative Christians in America, this is kind of their bread and butter is we are permitted to be insanely evil towards sinners on earth because we are doing so so they don't experience torment in hell. They, they view this as a kindness, right? It's got a, yeah. a real world parallel. And yet none of the individuals in the book really ever take account of the fact that like, by untethering themselves from these demons and feeling free to think gay thoughts, they might be tormented for all eternity. <laughs> like, it's well, a really weird part that they never really come to terms with. Well, actually, I think they kind of do, although I don't blame you for like kind of skipping over it because it's at the very, very end as they're no, escaping. No, no, no. I know, what, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. At the very end, the demons, once unshackled, they only take like the counselors and the higher ups to their little uh, evil hell yeah. to torture for all eternity. They don't. Um, they don't hunt so, down any of the gay kids. Yeah. So the character makes a remark that like I don't know about the morality system of these demons, but clearly homosexuality is not a big deal to them. Yeah. Uh, but like hurting kids is right. Clearly. Really lucky that that turned out to be the case because none of them knew any of that shit. Yeah. They just like, <laughs> in fact, when they unshackle the demons, were operating under the assumption that like the, the demons, demons were going to kill them too. <laughs> yeah. Are like innately evil and delight in pain. So much so that the guy who's like the spokesperson for the now deceased prophet is like, oh my God, like, what did you do? We had them shackled because we knew if they were unshackled, they would delight in the torment they would inflict upon you specifically. Holy fuck, why would you do this? What's your yeah. fucking problem? <laughs> and it is only, you know, a quirk of the fact that the demons were okay with gay people, which, you know, I mean, progressive win. Yeah. I, I do appreciate it from the demons <laughs> that, that everyone's okay. It is kind of strange to me that, like, this discussion is never had until it's too late to affect the outcome. Yeah. To be fair, it is also one of those things where they make it clear that, you know, a lot of these elements line up with, with what we think of as the biblical hell. But also, as they point out, a lot of this comes from, like, Dante's Inferno, da the Divine Comedy, which is not yeah. a biblical text, despite the fact that people seem to take it as like, oh, yeah, hell well, has was... nine layers. That's in the Bible, right? <laughs> no, that's in uh, Bible heresy. fan fiction. Yeah, it was... <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, a significant amount of biblical work is just fanfic that, you know, got canonized Homestuck 2 style. Yeah. But they make a big deal of like, you know, this might not be a biblical hell. This might be an alternate dimension of some kind, some sort of weird Lovecraftian plane that these Christians found. 
and just, like, looked at it and assumed it was hell and assumed these were demons. Like, if they're the ones putting the shirts and the name tags on, who's to say that demon's name is Packed? Maybe they were just picking names of demons. They're like, oh, yeah, this is clearly this one from this ancient text and just put it on there. They don't seem to have the ability to, like, communicate and ask their names. It's not even sure if the, the demons use language or whatever. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I understand. Uh, it's it's just very strange because I think it would have been super simple to be like, oh, no, you know, these people are just acting completely cynically. But I think it's much more interesting for it to be like, no, the antagonists in this book are operating under the assumption that they are performing an incredible kindness for these people, that they view them as like individuals who are unfortunately plagued with gay thoughts that they kind of have a moral obligation to get rid of because the alternative is they'll be tortured forever in hell. Yeah. You know? It's, it's one of those things where uh, one of the topics we'll talk about in a moment is that in a lot of ways this book isn't subtle. You know, a lot of its messaging yeah. is yeah. very on the yeah. nose. But when it comes to religion, it is surprisingly nuanced in that it doesn't paint the religious people as these, like, mustache-twirling bad guys who don't actually believe in what they preach and are just out there to get power. Like, no, they believe in it. And in some ways, that's kind of what makes them more frightening. Yeah, I guess I guess we can move to that. Yeah. We probably should just talk about kind of faith with a capital F as a concept for this part, because <laughs> it, it, the way the book tackles it is is really strange. So or not strange. It's very interesting. Um, yeah. It's strange insofar as it would have been easier to do something else. Yeah. So the main character is being suffocated by like ne functionally Ned Flanders family. Yeah. <laughs> and then upon realizing that she's become tethered to a demon as part of this religious ordinance, basically does a 180 and becomes a Reddit atheist. Yeah completely loses her faith yeah you find out that her girlfriend is like a portland style witch <laughs> a real like 20 year old goth girl but this is kind of i i made the mistake that many people do upon reading these works and i went to goodreads uh to see what people <laughs> thought about it uh goodreads is so bad i don't know a little bit of a tangent i don't know if you've ever read goodreads goodreads is a bunch of people who log on and then proudly proclaim how little of the book they read it's crazy <laughs> so many of the top comments are like did not finish 20 percent in it's like really you didn't you spent 30 minutes with this book what's your it's it's 250 pages what's your problem yeah just make it through it one thing they were very unkind about was the characterization of the main character in which she does very neatly after kind of understanding that she has been cursed in this way slot into a lot of ya style tropes about the strong girl who realizes her faith is a lie but one thing these DNF motherfuckers would be well served to do is finish the fucking book because I think the book does a decent job of also dismantling that mentality. Yeah. This woman almost immediately is like, oh, you know, my faith has been totally shaken. I don't know if Jesus was like real and if he's like a, a guy that I should even pray to. And then the guy that she's with is like, I'm sorry, you saw a demon and you were like, oh, I guess the Bible's fake. <laughs> isn't that like he rightfully points out he's like the the demons are clearly real there's got to be something good this isn't, week, isn't, right? isn't that like a core tenet of the bible is the <laughs> demons are real you saw visual proof of it and you were like i knew that like neil degrasse tyson was right it's crazy <laughs> and i i think the book does a pretty interesting job of recognizing that faith capital f faith as a concept and even faith in specifically jesus can like all things be wielded as this impossible tool of control right yeah but it also can help individuals find kind of great inner strength and just like, you know, I think this is a pretty obvious parallel, a significant amount of, you know, practitioners of Christianity in the U.S. use it to hurt others. So to do others, use it to be welcoming and, you know, help those around them and like give people a sense of purpose and build a community. Yeah. And, and that that kind of ideology, I think, is kind of exemplified by the character of Saul, not particularly shocking. You know, that's basically what he stands for. 
Uh, but it's it's very funny to read a book in which one character is like role playing a Reddit atheist by like just deciding to believe the opposite of what her parents believe one of them is like a west coast stereotype of a goth gf and the third is like guys like we have proof positive that christianity is real in front of us come on (laughs) but it's it's frustrating to hear those three perspectives mash up against each other and people be like i disagreed with the girl it's like yeah dumbass she's wrong what do you want me to do (laughs) And I mean, to be fair, she does have sort of like her elements at the end. The whole reason she is able to free the demons is because she put faith in a piece of like scripture she read that like maybe these holy words will actually do something. Mm -hmm. And I believe there is a couple moments at the end where she's just like, she's like, I can't believe in what I believed before, but maybe there is more to the world. Maybe there is something to believe in. Mm hmm. Although I will say, even as an like an atheist, I don't think she ever explicitly says she's an atheist, but she just makes it clear, yeah. like, yeah, she doesn't believe in anything. Yeah. Uh, not anymore. It felt a lot more believable, and it made a lot more sense just because of her personality. Mm-hmm. Because even when you meet her where she is convinced in the religion and she does believe in it, she's this very analytical person, this very, like, by the numbers, memorizing facts. She's, like, spitting out all this trivia And I believe that might tie in a little bit. You were talking about her autism being like a core character trait, which is something I didn't even pick up on. I thought she was just like a nerd. (laughs) Oh, oh, so the autism work in here is really good. It is truly (laughs) autastic. I don't want to get too much into identities. Chuck Tingle, I think, is very open about his own autism. The autism actually does a pretty good job masking, pun intended, for the homosexuality. Because I was reading the early sequences in which Isaiah like holds her hand and she's like, why is this guy holding my hand? That's going to be cumbersome to jump with. (laughs) I was reading that as like, oh, this girl's autistic. Like, I see what's going on here. Uh, Where she's like having trouble grappling with her gay feelings. I don't know, Gustavo Fring style. Anyone else have gay thoughts? I thought it was because she was like, I don't understand these feelings because I am a heterosexual. Like from an analytic perspective, be like, well, you know, yeah. what am I? I jealous. The also describing it as like a sort of jealousy is like, ah, what a what a great way. To <laughs> I'm not the first person to make that leap, but I, I always love seeing it written. I, I like that the family calls it a curiosity. And it's like, yeah. no dog. She just like she vomited up flies and wants to know why right yeah um and it's nice because you get the suffocating experience of being a gay person in like a town that surrounds a gay conversion camp but you also kind of get a little glimpse into how suffocating it is to be autistic in a world that like really doesn't like that (laughs) there's a couple of mentions of like tapping out fingers and stuff and there's a lot of specific experiences that she has specifically as an autistic person that are sort of robbed from her in very strange ways there's no door on the door frame and he's like you will feel it down see if there's any hinges and she does and she's like hmm i i remember feeling something different here before like i don't yeah. like maybe that was something she did and it was taken from her the other thing that i i guess tipped me off is there's a lot especially early about facial expressions of everyone as they're talking And the way she describes facial expressions, it sounds like people go from, like, happy and jovial to, like, stern and silent immediately. But it's like, no, she's just, like, paying a lot of attention to this kind of thing because, you know, as an autistic person, you spend a lot of time being like, okay, what's the right emotion to display at this moment? And so, of course, you recognize it in other people as well when they're obviously faking an emotive response. And so... I thought the autistic stuff was real good. I thought it was nice. I almost wish they just hadn't really mentioned it even because like, yeah, uh, cause well, it, I mean, it to be fair, sense. if they had it, I would not have known, but that's, well, it would I don't make know sense a for a, um, autism. it would make sense for a family like this to call it something stupid and like 20 Z <laughs> like, Oh, it's a, it's a curiosity. Oh, she's hypersensitive or something like that. This is a classic. She's just, she's just a little special. She's got a special brain. Yeah. You know, going back to the atheism religion thing, because we got off a little tangent there. It never really struck me as annoying. It struck me as just like before when she was quoting trivia and everything, she'd be like, you know, starting to think about something, following the logical conclusion, going from this to this. And then she'd run into, well, then I'd have to question my faith and I'm not allowed to do that. I shouldn't be doing that. And she would like back away from it. So once that barrier shattered, it, it made sense to me that she would suddenly be like, I can't assume that any of that is true. 
I have to start with the assumption that none of it is true and start to build things up based on what I can perceive. Yeah. Which is why even when she sees the demon, she's like, well, these aren't necessarily biblical demons as we know them. These could be extra planar beings of some sort. Mm -hmm. And of course, Saul is just like, that's a demon from hell. (laughs) Like, clearly. I I don't know. And, and, you know, not to belabor the point, but she's like a kid. She's like 20 something years old. And she's feeling out her identity for the first time ever. I think we all went through a Reddit atheist phase, all right? And, like, <laughs> some of us are still in it. But, like, you know, it it just, uh, it seems like such a weird thing to be mad about, right? Yeah. Like, she's she's written, like, someone trying on this position for the first time. And people rightfully call her out on it and are like, that's stupid you're being dumb i was just reading it and being like i i put down the book right now because she was written so bad it's like you dumb fuck don't you know that characters have arcs of course they're not good now they're gonna learn shit that's what Uh, literature is about final thing i'm gonna mention about goodreads i hate 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 that if you do this on goodreads fuck you i i hate this thing that people do where they write down like the thoughts that they have while they're reading and the thoughts are like you shouldn't have done that or um what and then they post them on goodreads (laughs) they go check out check out my notes for during this period and then they wrote them and i'm like this doesn't mean anything to me like when you say um what what does that mean to me what am i supposed to i was supposed to use context clues to be like oh they were on page 210 and they're referring no dude like write what you thought oh what about write what was inconsistent to you well you're fucking uh, it's weird that people can read so much and yet know nothing about writing yeah but uh what was it while while we're talking about faith a little bit before we go completely from this there was another question that sophie had although i'm not sure if you necessarily want to talk about this on a podcast she was coming at this uh, from the perspective of someone who wasn't raised religious who didn't really have any of that in her life and has never really had like faith as a tenant in her life and she was really curious as to how someone who did have some religion or did have some faith would feel and i don't have any opinion on that because i am the like reddit atheist that says none of that stuff makes sense and i wasn't sure where you felt on that okay well you're gonna hate this answer is that i'm also the epic reddit atheist oh okay (laughs) well okay so but in preparation for this question i did have a, a a talk with my wife who is Uh, I think grappling with a lot of the same problems that the Guinness are. She's a member of the Catholic Church, and I don't know if you know this, but it hasn't been a good 15 (laughs) years for the Catholic Church. (laughs) No, not really. Pope Francis is doing his best to massage the, I guess I would say, reputation, but there is a diocese in Baltimore that's doing its best to keep it where it is. Anyway, she is grappling with a lot of the same fundamental issues here, which is the understanding that religion can be wielded as this like horrifying weapon and even when wielded with kindness has motivations that are based on a lot of the same fundamental assumptions as like the evil one you know i I think we've already mentioned it but they say something to the effect of kingdom of the pine isn't really that different than any other sect you know it's not like they're like and remember you're evil they're just like value endurance and that's like not a big (laughs) you know that's not that big of a deal nothing that's said in here from the perspective of the counselors or the therapist or anything like that is like so shocking that you'd be like oh my god what the fuck yeah, it would fit in with a lot of, like, mainstream religious stuff you'd hear from, like, a variety of Americans and a variety of different sects. Similarly, two different Catholic churches are going to have a huge variation in how they treat the people around them much more than, say, a, a Catholic and a Protestant, as crazy as it sounds. <laughs> and a lot of that is because, despite the motivations being similar, the actions taken on Earth are the actions of men. And I think... The book does a good job of sort of detailing how faith can be both this weapon that you use to hurt, but also a a shield that you use to protect yourself, and how a lot of the thought patterns that it encourages are huge assistances to, uh, to the characters. And I think the character of Saul spending a lot of time being like, no, it is important to me to have faith, to have a personal relationship with the divine. It's important to me to be involved with the people around me and helping in ways that I can. And still go into church. Yeah, uh, doesn't preclude them from being a part of that church. And I think you'd be hard-pressed to find people who are faithful in America 
that this is the thing that is hard to grapple with. The remaining people who go to church in America largely aren't like Bible thumping rednecks. Certainly they do exist, you know. Yeah. But largely they're people like Saul who are like, I believe the church. I believe its tenants. I think it has tremendous potential to heal and to assist, and I want to be a part of that. And then other people sort of invoke it to do these terrible things. Yeah. I mean, that's the the one thing that I've learned in sort of like my whole religious educational journey, especially over the last 10 years or so, is just the fact that despite how often people in America get labeled as just like Christians, Christians are not a monolith. They run, they are so much variety. There's so many different people doing things for so many different reasons, even within like the same version of Christianity. And then once you get into those versions, like, oh my God, the difference between like a Pentecostal and a Baptist and an evangelical and like, oh, I'm a seventh day Adventist. That's different from the six day Adventist and yada, yada. Oh my God. Well, (laughs) and, and, and the difference between two different, churches of the same denomination can be really big yeah uh, like um uh, a lot of the catholic churches that jillian has attempted to become a uh, part of the priest will say something weird and like you know kind of trumpian or political or like you know <laughs> we we must protect the sanctity of the unborn and it's like she has to be like fuck you know i don't think i can be a part of this one and then she'll go to another one and they're like all humans have the right to dignity you know uh, it's hard in this time when we're demonizing people from other nations to remember that we're all children of god and she's like okay i mean it's the same scripture but even two different places can be very selective even within the same denomination about how they use it oh yeah it's, it's actually very fascinating. And I, we, I could sit here and talk about like different religious stuff for, for ages, but it, it is just interesting to me, at least, uh, again, coming as someone who doesn't have faith, but has some respect for people who have faith. Saul strikes me as like this very shining example of how you can do a faithful person right. But I can't help but thinking about like my one friend, you know, a good guy for the most part, but he goes to a Baptist church where the minister says some pretty awful things. And I could imagine him not even being willing to read this book because it has a gay like character in it. <laughs> ah, Baptists. Some things yeah. never change, baby. Fucking Southern Baptists, I tell you what. <clears throat> you know, actually, so it's fun, like, I... fun bit of uh, MBT trivia. They aren't traditional Baptists, but uh, my the house that I grew up in is uh, three blocks down from the Westboro Baptist Church. <laughs> fantastic they were that's, that, that they were cool uh, in a lot of ways similar to the uh <laughs> the people in this uh book except a little more overt they actually we went to school with all their uh like kids all the kids raised in the cult and they were just bullied relentlessly and they were like dude we fucking hate it too like i don't know what you want us to say <laughs> like but they but they'd be out there with the signs what are they gonna do they're like seven years old they can't say no to their mom gross but yeah, I was just going to say, if there is anyone religious in the the audience somehow, is Saul just like what an atheist wants religious people to be? Like, is there anyone out there with faith who's like, yeah, Saul gets it? Or is he like an atheist writing a religious person? Yeah, I, I get the sense that it might be that. But I, I, I would really also be interested in hearing what people say. Yeah, the comments on these are always great because even though we don't get a huge audience here, the people who are diehard... Legs talk about bookers. There's got to be a better name for that. You know, there are people who like right. There are people like Sophie. I'm not sure if I mentioned that. Sophie apparently is like the number one LTAB fan. She submitted like half of these questions. Uh, And I guess we did talk about this a little bit, but I do want to give a little extra credit, just a little shout out to Chuck Tingle's world building, to his ability to make lore. That's one of the things where, even when you're talking about the Tinglers, even in the few that I read... I was kind of struck by, you know, how all these different stories seem to share a universe that had like a shared lore that he would just kind of like hint at like, oh, well, this character is also here or this quirk about the world is present throughout. It's not bad writing. It's like just this. And specifically, like, obviously he's got his own version of hell that has its unique little lore, but I was surprised at how much he had fleshed out the children of the pine is that what they're called kingdom of the pine children yeah yeah kingdom of the pot yeah yeah kingdom of the pine children of the pine whatever because every once in a while they would just mention like 
oh yeah, the prophet. And we shake hands with our right hand because his left one got chopped no, off. No, he, he chopped it and off. And I kept him, waiting for him to do himself. like... It was his grand sacrifice. His left hand for an audience with God. I was like, that's tight. That's cu- that's fucking cool. It's been like a couple days now and now I can't remember. But I thought it was one of those things where like, you know, oh, it was the 1800s and he got to run in with the cops and he got shot in the hand and he ended up having to remove it. And then he's like, this is my sacrifice for the church. Oh, it might have been. I don't know. I don't know. That's one of the things is like, they kind of drop hints about that. We know that's like an element of the prophet, but there was never like a time where they just sat down and told you like the history of the pine. You get the idea of like, yeah, they're kind of tied in with capitalism. They've got those four tenants, yeah. which are, I, I don't have them written down, but they're just like, you know, be studious, have willpower or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and it really kind of struck me, especially as someone who's been doing like deep dives lately into learning about like, you know, the, the history of the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witness, the Seventh Day Adventist or whatever. This would fit in right alongside them. This is not like drastically different, but it's also unique enough that I'm like, I could almost see this being a real thing. Yeah. I could get invested in this lore. Hopefully he brings them back for something. They make great antagonists. Yeah, no. Well, I think the whole time you're kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop with the Kingdom of the Pine, but it never does. It's like a completely coherent, normal religion. You know, it's everything they say at the beginning, you know, about what we believe is just straight out in the open. You know, you don't have to find out that they're doing nefarious stuff at the the Camp Damascus because they tell you right out that like, yeah, we're converting gay kids like that's. That's what's on the tin. You don't have to worry that they're a business that maybe cares a little bit more about money than some other things, because that's one of their core beliefs. And as we were talking earlier about the flies and everything, where you're like, yeah, the the coughing up flies is just a side effect of the memory wipe. And it makes me think of all those like cynical medications that get pushed out. And they're like, side effects may include anal leakage, complete brain death or whatever. Mm. And they're just like, yeah, you know, uh, your children will be completely free of the demon of gayness. Side effects may include barfing up flies. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the cost of doing business, baby. <laughs> and then the final thing we've got here, just a little light thing to round us off. Sophie apparently asks, would you want to fuck the demon? So I don't understand <laughs> why they give the lesbian the girl demon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that just seems like a recipe for disaster. One of the other lesbians she meets up with at like a diner has a boy demon. And I'm like, that makes sense. You know, you, yeah. you give the lesbian the boy demon. You give the lesbian the girl demon. That demon's coming back pregnant. <laughs> Somehow. I'll make it happen. Yeah, I ugh, I, I don't understand. What, what was the point of that? I don't know. I think the thing that turns me off is the mouth. They're described as having like grimy black and brown stains all over their teeth and i'm like nah i'm not no oh uh, you've never you've never done like the paper bag over the head <laughs> no i i've That's i've been the trip. baggy most of my life <laughs> Oh, that's pretty neat, especially if you're like a gooner who's grown up on hentai or whatever. You could just print out a picture of your favorite anime waifu, put that on that plastic bag, like shit goes to town. For me, it's the big long fingers. Oh, I like strangely. I enough. like the fingers. That shit would get directly uh, to my prostate. <laughs> They have long, slender fingers for some reason. <laughs> yeah, I don't trust that. But I mean, there's a reason I'm not at Camp Damascus, you know. I ain't yeah. into that. I'm so straight. The first thing I did as soon as I got home was brick up the back door. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> but that that does, uh, as silly as that question is, it does bring up a little bit of a point that I thought was kind of funny, which is as soon as they found out that the demons were mortal and could be killed... They didn't think to, like, reason with them. They didn't think, like, oh, I wonder if we could communicate them. I wonder if there's some way we could, like, break their binding or whatever. Like, they had that spell from, like, early on, the, like, breaking people Mm -hmm. free. And they're immediately like, oh, no, we got to burn these things in Mm -hmm. fire. Packard's got to (laughs) die. And it does make me think, it's it's one of the few times where I'm like, maybe if this book was a little longer, it would be an interesting scene of her, like, you know, purposely thinking those thoughts to bring it and then just trying to be like what do you want from Mm -hmm. me like what can what can i can i do anything to make you go away why me and just seeing if they could get any kind of reaction out of it because i think that would be some cool not only just to 
to give the characters a little, make them a little less bloodthirsty, but also to kind of build up maybe some of the lore to kind of hint at the fact just how uh, enslaved the demons mm-hmm. are, whether or not they they enjoy the work that they're doing. They're like, yeah, we still get to torment people. We like doing this. Or if it's one of those things where like, Packet is like struggling against it or whatever, but maybe that would humanize the demons too much. Yeah, it is weird because as you learn the demons have like a moral code, it's like, damn, I do feel bad that we just like iced a couple of them. <laughs> Especially because they were like enslaved when we iced them. So it's not like, you know, they had a chance to run away. They were tethered to us. You know, we're stuck in this together. I'm not trying to be like, a jackass or whatever, but if I was an enslaved demon and then you freed me and I was like, thank you for freeing me. Wait, are you the people who killed those other demons? I would probably, (laughs) I would probably, if I'm already doing a bunch of killing, I would probably kill you too. It seems like a no brainer. If this was like a slasher horror movie, that would be like the twist ending where like they ignore all the other like gay, gay kids or whatever. They're like, they're fine. And then they grab Rose yeah <laughs> well what was it rose's girlfriend would be fine because she didn't help yeah, willow didn't do shit rose willow's, willow's demon was yeah. killed by rose that was that's true yeah they just go specifically she's like what what did i do and they're like you murdered our friends <laughs> it, it was crazy i i will say this kind of dovetails nicely into what, what i'd like to i think kind of be my last point which is um i did feel like once they went back to camp it was kind of a foregone conclusion. Yeah. I wish it had been a little different. From there, it was really just paint by numbers. Everything that had to happen happened. And then the the weird thing that happened at the end also didn't make a ton of sense. It was like, man, I thought they were they were killing. Yeah, it was kind, kind of fast paced, kind of like an action scene. A very Hollywood ending. <sighs> yeah. It, and I it, mean, very cinematic, fair, very cinematic. Yeah. I, I, I don't think I could have expected anything less from Chuck Tingle. Like, yeah, you know, I was questioning whether or not he would be able to write horror but i knew he wouldn't write a bad ending right that guy is despite everything about him the one continuing theme in all his work is that love triumphs all no matter what love is real baby i i've so i've heard (laughs) but yeah i think we'll go ahead and call it from there just once again you know i don't know if chuck tingle ever listens to like reviews or whatever but good job chuck i enjoyed it thumbs up Good book. Go ahead and check it out. Camp Damascus, ten out of ten. Yeah, I I, uh, I appreciated it a lot. It was a little, it was a little YA, a little more cinematic than I would have liked from a horror, but one of, one of the better ones we've looked at. I yeah. will say it knew what it wanted to do and it executed on it. It you did. Know, it did do it. Maybe you're not necessarily into that kind of vibe, but if you are, absolutely go for it. And it's weird because I'm looking back of the book and all the different like quotes and lines or whatever, all the different reviews. Mm -hmm. There's a surprising number of them that are just like, oh, it's a queer nightmare. It's like a timely, authentic story. Like, I guess, I don't know if that undersells it or not. I don't feel like you have to be into like queer fiction specifically. I feel like anyone can enjoy this. It's a, it's a marketing tactic. Uh, The way that uh, I'm not going to get too into the way YA is now, but (laughs) you know, I, I, I would call this a good book, but that doesn't sell to the people on Goodreads who want to fucking post a list of the first thing that came to their head while they were reading it. (laughs) Listen, (laughs) books are good. But over the past 10 years, the number one group of people that I've grown to hate with every fiber of my being is readers. <laughs> Y'all got to get much better at reading. I'm realizing many of you are very bad at it. That's why next year for the Halloween, for the spooky podcast, we're going to be reading reviews on Goodreads because nothing oh, is scarier God. than, than the me lack up. of media literacy in the modern age. I'm looking up Homestuck epilogues on Goodreads. <laughs> And we're gonna read those. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna piss our pants. Eventually, we gotta actually read Homestuck. I've read it. You, you gotta have to read, read it, it again. You gotta reread it. I don't need to. For the I podcast, remember it all. You gotta refresh. <laughs> oh wow! Actually, I, I'm I'm looking at the responses on on uh, the Homestuck epilogues. They are three point seven, which is what I like to see. Uh, it is largely people who are like, it's really good. And then every fifth one is one star and they're like, um, this one was a problem. <laughs> is it 3.7 out of five or out of 10? Out of five. Okay. That's, that's not too bad. If it's out of 10, I'd be like, oh, oh no. 
It's like, that's at least halfway. That's pretty good. But yeah, that, that's it for this time. We've rambled long enough. If you like this, go ahead and make sure to like the video. Comment down below. Let us know if you want to keep doing this year by year. And you know, if you have any suggestions for spooky stuff next time, you know, leave them down in the comments. We're always looking for modern horror. We've already read all the classics. Every classic is done with. We that's just need true. some good new stuff to read through. So put that down. Uh, ch once more, thank you to MBT for coming out here. Check out his podcast if you haven't yet. Oh, I, I love coming here every year. It's, it is a highlight for me and it makes me, it gives me a deadline to read a book in October. <laughs> How many books you read this year? V way fewer than last year. I feel like a <laughs> fucking moron. I've read like, Oh God, I was trying to read 32 this year. And so far I've read 12. Ah, you're still doing better than me. I think I'm on, I think this is the third, but I mean, I wrote a book, so, you know, that's got to count. That's like 10 books, right? Okay. Asshole. No, uh, I, I, I didn't expect, I, I guess I could, I could bump that number, but a significant amount of the books that I've read this semester are called like a brief introduction to federal Indian law. And it's like, okay, well, <laughs> do you want me to talk to you about, you know, uh, the, the Marshall trilogy? I could do that shit. <laughs> Never. Is that like a, a lawyer joke or is that actually like fiction? Uh, it's you no, know, it's it's three Supreme Court cases that uh, form the first uh, kind of foundations of uh, federal Indian law. Ah, exciting! I think tune we'll in next year one. when I explain Johnson v. McIntosh <laughs> and its implications for the nascent United States. And until then, good luck. And oh, oh Jesus! Oh God! There was a lot of flies in that one. Yeah, and keep reading through the flies.